Hello and welcome back and today I want to talk about the perfect way to set up your QNAP NAS for the first time. This is part one of a large series of videos I'm going to be making about setting up a QNAP NAS right the first time. Not just the setup of the device itself but also the right apps to use for you the user because sometimes although QNAP have a tendency to give you quite a lot of apps not all of them are going to be suitable to what you need to do but all of this is going to be useless if you don't set up the device the right way the first time so what we're going to do first is we're going to set up QTS the first time <coughs> we're going to set up our RAID we're going to set up our shared folders we're going to set up our IP and we're going to set up some mapped network drives so without further ado let's make our way to the screen and here we are at the desktop setup on my Windows PC for setting up a QNAP NAS for the first time. As mentioned, we're all going to be focusing on the initial setup and RAID and IP with a few other things roaming along the way. The first thing you're going to need to do if you're a complete noob to NAS is download the QFinder Pro application. It's available for Mac and Windows, completely for free, really easy to get hold of. Once you've got it, and you've powered up your NAS and put your drives inside as per the manufacturer's instructions, um, have the NAS already booted up for about three to five minutes. Then, when you've got this application installed, scan your local area network to find the NAS. As long as the NAS and the device you're using to set this up on are on the same network, that is to say using the same internet connection, if you wanna be really caveman about the terminology, then the NAS will appear like so. And if a NAS hasn't been set up before, then you will be invited to initialize the device for the first time. Click yes, and we'll make our way into the NAS. Now, we're using a TS251B here, um, which is the QNAP NAS released in the closing stages of 2018. But what I would say is that these rules that I'm gonna show you today, along with all the other steps in our QNAP setup guide, can be applied to pretty much any QNAP NAS. Just bear that in mind. Um, so we've got the initial splash screen here, and of course we can change the language if we want, but for now we'll stick with English because unfortunately that's the only language I can throw at you guys. Next we have to name the NAS, so in the case of this NAS, let's call it TS251B, which is the name of the NAS. Next the username, admin, and of course we can change this password to whatever we so choose. I'm going to double check that I've got that case active, and we're going to go for a bog standard, just the word password. You can see it there, and then we click next. From here, we're going to be asked to set the date and time on the device, but I would recommend just let it synchronize with the local internet connection because there's no advantages to having a custom time frame on this device that I'm aware of. Next, we can talk about IP addresses. Now, for those that watch my Synology setup videos, you will already see a distinct difference between QNAP and Synology when it comes to their user interface and kind of their main mission statement. Synology hide a lot of their setup information and you can set a Synology up in about three clicks. Unfortunately, because of that closed setup and hiding all the, what they perceive to be difficult decisions, you can miss out on some really important setup factors to make the most of your device. QNAP gives you these options, but you can go use all the defaults. An IP is the device's address on your network. All of the devices on your home or office network have an IP. That's the address they're all share, um, they're all on with regards to that network. So the first three numbers don't really change, but the last number denotes the device's position on the network. If you leave this option at DHCP, that just means that the device will dynamically change if there's more or less devices on the network. And if your network has hundreds and hundreds of devices, you might see an advantage in that. But me personally, I will always use a static IP. It's just so much more useful for locating the device in the long term. And then a dynamic IP, if you start setting up the links to the device that are never gonna move and can never, you can't afford for them to change, you should always set a static IP to ensure that the NAS doesn't move around on your network dynamically and fluidly and potentially break those links. If you go for the dynamic IP, most of it will still work, but I personally would always select a static IP and then always just use the IP you're starting on, which is the one ending in six here. Then click next. It will light, um, the IP address has not changed, this may lead to an IP conflict. Now, that is worth touching on that if another device is statically set to this IP, 
it can be problematic but once again you'd need to have a particularly busy network to bear this in mind and even if you did you'd want to know that the device is still on that static location for all your linked devices moving forward we can then say what kind of uh, platforms we're going to be dealing with and once you use these it will tailor the device to uh, the file system and the way files are handled to cater for these operating systems if you're going to have a mixed operating system environment or the pcs and laptops and stuff in your environment just click a ticks next to wall and there we go there's our summary of our initial setup so for now we can get things moving and get the operating system installed on this nas I'll fast forward now to when the installation of these settings is complete and then we can make our way into storage management. From here we just need to enter that log information that we created earlier. Nice and simple and then we'll log our way in. From here we will get to see the user interface of QTS, the QNAP operating system and graphical user interface. Uh, the first time you boot up the device there will be a, about four different pop-ups right there at the start of the screen just telling you a little help guide to letting you know things can be done don't worry they won't boot up every time just say you don't want these things to boot up on the initial setup you can also ignore this area with regards to licenses until you utilize more of the device chances are you're not going to use most of these but it's nice to know that this is an option that's open to you and here we have the user interface here. Again, if you have any updates, they're available here at the bottom, and there is a user interface update of QTS itself very regularly. Now, next thing we need to do is start setting up our storage because there's not much use to announce without an area of space to play with. So we'll go to the storage in the snapshot area, and from here, we can prepare the hard drives. Now, this NAS has got two hard drives inside, and these two hard drives we're going to put in a RAID 1. That is a mirror so that the drives can basically have exactly the same data across both of them. There's lots of information here. We're going to skip all that for now. And I'll give you the nice, chewable, easy, friendly version. So the first thing we need to create is a storage pool. A storage pool is all of the drives put together in an area of space. And within that space, we can put all of our data in different volumes. But before I get ahead of myself... Let's go into the storage pool option. Now from here, we will be invited to create a RAID system. Now RAID, for those that aren't aware, stands for Redundant Array of Independent Disks. This is a system whereby you can have multiple drives that serve three purposes. One, they combine all of that space together to create one visible drive to your connected systems. Two, it acts as a safety net system where all too often than not, if a drive does fail because of hardware failure, and again, second most fragile part in any NAS is the hard drives, then your data will not be lost thanks to the RAID system and other RAID um, backups and systems like Parity and more. The third benefits of RAID are to do with read and write, whereby if you have data spread across multiple disks, it can greatly increase the read and write speed um, of that data because multiple drives are being read to or written to at a given point. Now from this point forward if you were going to utilize SSDs you can create a tiered storage option. For now we're going to skip that because that's not too important and just click next. It has noticed that it's found two hard drives in this device. Today we're using Seagate Ironwolf Pro series drives of 14 TB each. So this 2 TB drive this 2TB NAS drive, I should say, has the potential for 28 terabytes of storage with 14TB drives. So we're going to select both of those drives and we're going to select a RAID 1. Now, if we had a larger QNAP NAS, one with 4, 6, 8 or 12 hard drive bays and above, these other RAID options will become available. A single means it's a disk on its own. JBOD means just a bunch of drives, and therefore all the drives work independently. RAID 0 combines all the drives together, but in the event that one drive dies, you lose the entire storage array and your data. A RAID 1 has two mirrored copies of the disks, that's the one we're going to go for. A RAID 5 is three or more disks where you lose one drive of capacity, but 
data is spread across all of the drives in wave forms where drive data is written across all the drives and with each wave of data being written to the device one drive instead of having data has a blueprint of the rest of the data known as parity and with every wave the parity is written to a different drive the result is that if one of your drives dies the NAS can rebuild your data using the existing data and the parity across all the disks. A RAID 6 does exactly the same thing but it creates two parities and therefore protects you from two hard drives worth of failure. Of course in the case of RAID 5 and 6 because the CPU has to work a little harder to build that parity read and write speeds can be a little slower. And finally RAID 10 is like a combination of RAID 1 and RAID 0. It splits the storage you've got into two pools so at least four disks and then pairs them together the result is you can technically survive up to two disks of failure but with increased read and write compared with RAID 6 however it isn't perfect and if you are looking for two disks of failure I would always recommend a RAID 6 so we'll click next and carry on next we can talk about the alert threshold the alert threshold is when users will be given a warning when storage is reaching um, its limit and you're running out of space. For now, we'll leave it at 80% storage capacity. And that's it. This is the details of the storage pool we are creating. Next, we click Create. It will, of course, warn us that the disks will be wiped, but we're using brand new disks today, so that's not a big problem. Now, it's worth mentioning that different RAID groups take more or less time to create. A RAID 1 on a QNAP will take somewhere between 2 to 8 hours to complete. A RAID 5 can take 12 to 18 hours, and a RAID 6 a whopping 18 hours or more. This does differ, of course, on the CPU and the NAS you're utilising, as well as the number of drives and the enterprise nature of those drives. We are using enterprise level hard drives at 7200 RPM, so this may take a bit of extra time. In the meantime, now we've done the setup, the RAID and the IP, we can move on to the folders and how to create shared folders. Initializing or rebuilding RAID. I was going to cut it there, but I thought I'd keep that notification sign in there just to let you know that if you have a QNAP NAS with a speaker, it will notify you throughout this process. So now the storage pool is being create created, we need to create a volume on this device. When we click New Volume, this will help us create the area of space that we're going to utilise. Now, a little known fact is that a NAS can actually have multiple volumes on one storage pool. The storage pool is all of the space, all of the drives. Volumes are like on your computer and you have C drive, D drive, E drive and more. So you can create individual storage areas for your data, with each one being utilised perhaps for media, for surveillance, for backups and more. And this means that all of these volumes become their own repository of that data. We'll click next and we can see that right now this volume is only 2.5 terabytes out of a potential 12.53 terabytes. Remember we're in a RAID 1. Now we can max that out if we wish and it will use up all the space on the available drives but it is worth mentioning that then you won't have the opportunity to create other volumes. So for now I'm just going to create a 10 terabyte volume on that disk and leave another 2.5 perhaps for surveillance in a later video. We can also name the volume and we're going to name this volume RAID 1. Vol 1. Again there's lots of other more technical information here with regards to setting up file systems and more but we're going to leave those as default to keep things nice and easy. Then we click next with information about the volume we're creating and then we click finish. It is now creating our volume on that storage pool. The RAID, as mentioned earlier, is going to be nowhere near complete. If we go to the disks area while it creates that volume, I can show you how much time has elapsed on our RAID 1 creation. 
the synchronization is nowhere near complete. And if we go to the top, we can see that right now it's gone to a horrendous 128 hours. That will decrease rapidly. It's just at the moment, the system is so busy, it's having difficulty coming up with a correct form. But take my word for it, it is not going to take this obscene length of time and will in all likelihood only take a few hours. In the meantime, what you can do is take advantage of the volumes you've created. As you can see, it's letting you know that the RAID is still being created and that volume will live on that storage pool. It's only at 18% right now, but when it's complete, we can start looking into shared folders and mapped network drives. So I'm just going to fast forward a little. Right, so our volume is completed. It's being optimized there in the background, but don't worry, it just, it's already good to go. Um, and in the background here, we can also see that the raid has dipped to 92 hours. Again, don't worry, it's going to be way less than 92 hours to take uh, for that storage pool to be created. Also, you might hear some noise there in the background. That's coming from the NAS as it prepares the raid. And as, of course, I'm using enterprise level hard drives, they do make a little bit more noise. So I apologize in advance for that little rumbling noise you might hear in the background. So, next thing we need to do is start looking at shared folders. And this will be the last thing we're doing on this video and we're looking at shared folders and map network drives and here is the folder structure that's been created on our volume now the this space here is always very useful indeed but perhaps you're going to need to uh, create a folder that can be accessed by other users over the network and indeed over the internet with the right settings so what we need to do is make our way here to this little plus symbol and click shared folder now again a shared folder is a folder of space that can be utilized by things outside of the NAS. And also it can be used for DLNA and just basically distributing your media, media with other users using the NAS. So we're gonna call this one share one. And we're not gonna give it a comment, but we can say where on NAS it's gonna live. And we can give it a manual path if you want, but trust me, this stuff, the automatic paths, are just as good. Now, you can configure the settings if you've got multiple users on your NAS, and we will be talking about how to create users and groups on the next video, but for now, let's just create this shared folder nice and easily. It will then create this shared space. As you can see, it lives on that volume that we've created. There it is. And just to show you, um, just a quick test to show that it's the same folder, we're going to call this folder proof. Now, the reason we've done that is I'm going to show you now how to create a shared mapped drive. And a mapped drive is how you, using Windows or Mac systems, can utilize the storage area on your NAS by using your operating system. So, for example, if we go to my PC settings, in these PC settings here, we've got the local drive, the C drive. And of course, anyone that's ever used a PC before should know that this is where Windows and all your programs live. But if you're using, utilizing a program on your PC or Mac system, but want all the files and everything to live on the NAS, you need to create a mapped network drive. Now I've got three there from a previous video, but what I'm gonna do is create a brand new one now for you. We head back to that QFinder Pro software we used right at the beginning of the video. From here we go to network drives we click network drives and it will search the local area network for those drives if you need to have a password such as the one we've created this is where we add it make sure we've got the right password there there's password from before and just get it to remember the credentials going forward and there is our mapped network drive share one so if we right click we, can ha we have the option in Windows to map this network drive if we so choose. Map network drive, select a letter. In the case of this device, let's go for Q for QNAP. And we can rename it if we want or the direct folder that we want to use. We click finish and there's our mapped network drive. If we go back to the main PC settings, there's share one and there's that folder proof. And this means we can run anything from photo video editing software to Word documentation and any kind of app that needs to be booted from files and have the files living on the NAS. In a future video, I'm going to show you guys about how to load, uh, how to download and utilize um, the NAS for your Steam library of games so you don't have to hold on to those enormous file assets 
on your PC or laptop system. But I'm going to wrap things up here. Uh, the raid is going to continue to build. In our next video, we're going to talk about users, groups, and how to install apps. And in later videos, we're of course going to talk about media, USB backup, surveillance, Plex, photography, downloading, cloud sync, and how to set up and have the perfect um, range of applications for HDMI. But this has been QNAP, first time set up, and I look forward to seeing you on the next video. Don't forget to click like and subscribe to get the most out of your NAS, and I'll see you next time.